1 Corinthians 13, turn there. I uh, promised I was going to do something this morning, and I'm going to do it. We are talking about the love of God, but I'm going to unhook that train just for a minute, or several minutes, and teach you a little bit of church history. Or let's say Bible history, all right? Give you a sort of an understanding of what God did with the gifts of the Spirit, all right? What God did with the gifts of the Spirit, because he tells it right here in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, back in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about the gifts of the Spirit. Um, let's see here. Yeah, look in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, look in verse 7. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Manifestation of the Spirit. This is where we, we're going to hold to what the Bible says. We're going to believe what the Bible says. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I absolutely believe in them. They're in the Bible. And they're there for a reason. So, it it is... When these gifts are manifested, and they're manifested in the biblical way, then that you can tell that they are God's Spirit being manifested. So, he says in verse 8, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now notice he said word of wisdom. The key is the word. The word. Where does wisdom come from? It comes from you knocking your head on stuff enough to where you don't knock your head on stuff enough anymore. Okay, wisdom comes from knowledge. Watch it, there's a low beam there. Understanding that is, that beam, if you hit your head on it, will hurt. Then wisdom is, how about I duck when I come to a low beam? That's wisdom. Okay, and that's how it works. So, the book of Proverbs Tells us, in fact, boy, I'm chasing rabbits already. Proverbs chapter 2, he tells his son, um, yeah, verse 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Wisdom is not this electrical touch of impartation given to you, and all of a sudden you just have wisdom. Wisdom comes from knowledge. And understanding and knowledge and understanding come from the mouth of God. The mouth of God is your Bible. So back here in 1 Corinthians 12, when he says um, the word of wisdom, there is no more perfect source for wisdom than the Bible. You want wisdom? Get it from the Bible. And that's the best wisdom. Uh, they say Confucius was a man of wise sayings. Confucius was a fool because he didn't know and believe in God's word. Didn't trust in it. To another, the word of knowledge. What better source of knowledge can you have than to know what God said? To know these stories that we teach in Sunday school. To know about Noah's flood and the creation and David and Goliath and, and all of this stuff. To know these things and to know them from the scriptures to another faith. Where does faith come from? Hearing, hearing by the word of God, by the same spirit to another gifts of healing. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, he sent his word and healed them uh, by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy. Uh, Ezekiel, he said, son of man, prophesy unto them and say unto them and prophesying is giving the words of the Lord. To another discerning of spirits. Bible says test the spirits to see whether they be of God. How can you test a spirit if you don't have a testing mechanism? A testing agent of some kind or a source by which you can compare what a spirit says against the truth of the word of God. To another uh, diverse kinds of tongues to another interpretation of tongues. I'm going to get into that in a minute. But all these worketh that one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, here's what happened. On the day of Pentecost, if you look at Acts chapter 2, turn there. Acts chapter 2. I'm 
And our buddy Jared's going to provide the background music for this teaching now, all right? So I love it. So Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like uh, as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, what were those other tongues? Was it a secret prayer language that only angels and God know what it is? No, that's not what it was. Because it says in verse 8, And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? The tongues that they were speaking was the gift of tongues given to those men who were speaking that on the day of Pentecost. As they were speaking, the people who had come from all these, and it lists all the different places they came from, verse 9 all the way down to verse 11, list all the different locations they came from. They all came speaking their own language. So they come, and there's a guy, and he speaks... Pamphylian. So he shows up in Jerusalem and he's, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a foreign country and don't know their language and you hear someone speaking English, automatically you're going, there's somebody speaking English. I wonder if they know how I can get my way out of here or whatever. Okay. So we, we gravitate to people who are of our own language. So here's a guy preaching in Pamphylian. So the Pamphylian guys show up and they're amazed that this man is preaching to them in their tongue. Others from Cappadocia. I don't know what Cappadocian sounds like, but there was a man preaching in the tongue of Cappadocia and the Cappadocians were there and they heard this man preaching to them in their language. They were, they, the Holy Ghost was giving words from God to these men in languages that they did not, as of this day, know how to speak them. But now they're speaking those tongues, and the people are there hearing them in their own tongue from where they were born. So that is the gift of tongues. It's not some secret prayer language from angels that nobody, not even you know what you're saying. That's not biblical. It's not right. So what happens then? God gives that as a gift. He gives the tongue and he gives an interpretation of the tongue. So, on the day of Pentecost now, understand, the only Bible that they had from the day of Pentecost on throughout all of the days before, let's say, A.D. 100, the only scriptures they had was the Old Testament. That's all they had. You have the gospel writers sometime after 35, 36 AD, somewhere around in there. They start writing. Luke starts writing. Matthew starts writing. You have the, the, the events given in the book of Acts, which went from somewhere around AD 30 somewhere through, let's say, AD 60 or 70, because it ends pretty much toward the end of the Apostle Paul's life. So Luke is writing this probably as it's happening. He finishes it out, but they still don't have the book of Acts yet. It's being written. During Paul's ministry, he's in the process of writing the letters to the Corinthians, letters to the Thessalonians, the letter to the Ephesians, the letter to the Galatian churches. He's in the process of writing those, but he hasn't written them all yet. So they don't have them yet. John has not written and is not going to write the book of Revelation until somewhere in the mid-90s. So, how does God then deliver His Word to the several churches that are there? How does God deliver the doctrines of the New Testament? He does so through, we see in uh, back in 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of prophecy. The Holy Ghost is at this time delivering his words to these prophets who are prophesying these things. Does everybody understand that? Because the Bible, the New Testament, as we have it now, 
has not been written yet. It's in the process, but it's not there yet. So does God just leave that early church void of doctrine? No, he delivers his words to these prophets, to these bishops, to these apostles, and they're speaking them to the people. Peter gets us a one portion of what God wants. Paul gets another portion. James has his part. And you have in every church, in every area where there is a Christian church, you have the Holy Ghost giving these men words from God. So now, keep that in mind. As we look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. That's what I have up on the screen. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, if they're prophecies from God, we've already established this from Deuteronomy 18. If they're prophecies from God, they all come to pass. So he's not saying that guys are going to prophesy, but it's not going to take place. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is where you have these prophets in this church, early church age from AD 33, somewhere to AD 100. During that time, God is delivering his words to these prophets, but God is going to shut that off. Okay, he's going to stop doing that. He's not going to be giving these private words to these localized prophets. Then it says, um, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. At some point, God is going to stop giving these unknown tongues or these other dialects to people he's going to he's going to he's going to cease doing that because he's going to do something better than that whether there be knowledge it shall vanish away so verse 9 for we know in part and we prophesy in part so now think about it uh mark wrote his gospel luke wrote his john's gospel for some reason, is significantly different in the way it's written and the stories that it tells and so on than Mark or Luke's or Matthew's gospel. So God didn't give, here's what I'm saying, God did not give the writing of the New Testament over to only one person. Does that make sense to everybody? He did not give it all to Paul. He gave Paul a considerable portion, but he didn't give it all to him. He didn't give it all to John. John was probably second as far as the number of books written, but John didn't get it all. Didn't give it all to Peter, didn't, but he gave a little bit to Peter, gave a little bit to James, gave some to John, gave some to Matthew, gave some to Paul. So now they're all prophesying, but they're prophesying in part during this early church age. But then John writes the book of Revelation and Jesus, just to make sure that we have no uncertainty about this. If you look at the end of the book of Revelation, verse 18, ch chapter 22, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. So John makes it pretty clear because let's say that um, I don't know when Peter was killed. I don't know when Paul was killed. But we know it was before A.D. 90. John was pretty much the one apostle that wasn't martyred for being an apostle. He's the one who died of old age. The only one. So John outlived all of them. So John's the last writer of the New Testament. Now, I watched a guy one time, one of these charismatic guys, try to place the writing of the book of Revelation somewhere around A.D. 50. And I'm going, why is he doing that? Because most, even the liberal scholars, will say that Revelation wasn't written until after A.D. 93 or somewhere around in there. So why was this guy saying that he felt that he thought the book of Revelation was written around A.D. 50 or A.D. 60? It's because of what's in Revelation 22, 18 and 19. Because if he can then look at Revelation and say, what that means is no words added only to the book of Revelation. 
because most of your charismatic people believe that God is still giving revelations. God is still giving words, and some of these guys are apostolic, which means that they believe that there are latter-day apostles, and God is still giving them new words. Okay? Don't fall for that. That's a trap. That's a setup. Book of Revelation, written last. John's the last surviving apostle, and Jesus deliberately waits until way after all the other apostles have died, and they've all written their, their letters and their gospels, and now he gives to John the book of Revelation. And at the end of the book of Revelation, he says, no more words added. Just like in any contract you have ever signed, there is a clause in that contract that says the words of this contract are exclusive. And as of the end of page, whatever last page it is, because a lot of times in multi-page contracts, you will have to initial every page. Do you not? Why, you, you, why do you do that? That signifies that you are in agreement that page seven is the last page. Just in case you show up with page eight in court or the other guy shows up with page eight in court. You can say, my initials are not on that page. I did not agree to that. That was added after we closed the deal. Does that make sense to everybody? Most contracts have that. And, you, and the new covenant is exactly that. It is a contract. It is legally binding. And God, the party of the first part, stipulates, and we agree to it, that there are no words added to this covenant after Revelation 22, verse 21, because it ends in the word, Amen. And that means, so be it, let it be established. We agree, this is how it's going to be. All right? So, back in... 1 Corinthians 13. For we know in part and prophesy in part. John had his part. Peter had his part. James, Paul, they all had their parts. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, what is it that that which is perfect? Well, there's several things here because he didn't just specify that it's the end of the New Testament or that it's the, the writing of the New Testament. There are multiple applications to this. But when we apply it to the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how God used them in the days of the early church and how God uses them and distributes them now, there's a clear difference. In the days of the early church, the gifts are given out severally to various representatives of God, whether they are a prophet or they are someone who has a gift of tongues or someone who is an apostle or a bishop. Those are given out severally and severed out. But as of the writing of the, of the book of Revelation, now you have the entirety of all of the books of the New Testament as one whole covenant. Does that make sense? Now we've gathered all the books together. Now that's all been written. And now that it's all been written, and Christ has signified that after Revelation 22, there are no more books, no more words, no more chapters, no more revelations. This is, this is the entirety of the contract right here. Now that which is perfect has come, that which is in part is done away. So now... Instead of a bishop, let's say the bishop of the church of Ephesus, instead of him getting portions from God during the 70 years after Christ left, now the bishop of the church at Ephesus can have the whole of the New Testament instead of just part of it. Does everybody understand that? He doesn't just get a little his little piece of it, now he gets Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd, Corinthians, Galatians. He gets the whole thing of the New Testament given to him. All right. And then once it was all written out, the New Testament language was what language? Greek. You have some of the Hebrew roots people saying, oh, no, no. The original New Testament was written in Hebrew. Really? How come there are no copies? There are no manuscripts anywhere and never has been 
of any of the New Testament books written in Hebrew. But the Hebrew roots people all claim that all of the New Testament was written in Hebrew. They even say things like this. In Revelation, Jesus introduces himself to John by saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And Jesus did that. Here's Jesus, born a Jew, lived a Jew, died a Jew, but now he's speaking Greek. Speaking a Gentile language. Identifying himself not by the first and last letters of the Old Testament, Hebrew, but the first and last letters of the New Testament, Greek. There's a change that's taken place. He's not the high priest of the tribe of Levi because he wasn't from the tribe of Levi. He's a high priest from the tribe of Judah, a different tribe. And Paul said in Hebrews, where there is a different high priest, there is of necessity a different law that goes with it, a different covenant. Okay, so you have, uh, where was I going with that? That was really good, but I forgot where I was headed now. Anyway, that which is perfect is now manifest. Oh, okay, here's what I was saying. You have some of the Hebrew roots people saying that, well, Revelation, John was a Jew, Jesus was a Jew, so Revelation would have been written in Hebrew, and it would have said, Jesus said, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the last, first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But he didn't say that. So they're saying, you have to believe what we say, even though there is zero evidence of what we say being true. There's no manuscript, there's no Hebrew nothing, and that's not what happened. Jesus now is identifying himself and sealing the book of Revelation in Greek, and from the Greek language... Because not everybody spoke Greek. Just as most of the people in this day, even on the day of Pentecost, most if all of these people were speaking Hebrew, why didn't God just give the gospel to them on the day of Pentecost in Hebrew? God gave them the language that they spoke. So now, now that the New Testament has all been written out in Greek, when we go from its central location, Jerusalem, and we're going to go out to the cities and the different countries and the different types of people outside of, in Acts chapter 1, he said it's going to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, by the time you get outside of Samaria, they don't speak Greek anymore or they don't speak it well. So now that New Testament has to be translated. And it was. It's translated into the old Italian language, somewhere around AD 150. Also at that same time, you have uh, Gail Rippinger wrote a book about this, about how the Bible was early translated into the Gothic language. And there are elements of English that come from that Gothic Bible, that Gothic language. There are words in Gothic that we have derived words from in English. And so clearly what God was doing at this point was now that he was waiting for the New Testament to be completely written out. Once it's written out and its copies are being distributed, then there is no more need for private prophecies from the Holy Ghost. So I'll give you an example. So you have the New Testament, right? So if some guy, Brian, if somebody comes to you and says, Man, I was praying in the Holy Ghost last night and God gave me some words from heaven and I've never seen anything like it and I'd like to share it with you. You're shaking your head. Why? How would you even know if this guy was even praying in the Spirit last night? You weren't there. You, don't know. you can't see inside of his brain to tell whether he's lying or not. You have what Peter said, a more sure word of prophecy. And Peter was using that exact example. He said, I heard God say, this is my beloved son. And so Peter goes around telling everybody. But then even Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. It's actually written down now in the scriptures, in the gospels. This is my beloved son. So if you don't believe me, you don't believe the scriptures. Okay, so that was the point of it. Now that we have that which is perfect, the writing of the New Testament, God's not going to be speaking individual prophecies to all these prophecies 
all these prophets and bishops and apostles because he's already given out everything and it's all been written down. And so God then signifies to us as New Testament believers. If somebody comes along and says, I got a prophecy from God and what he says does not match what you have in your Bible, you're not to believe him. Why would you believe him? And how could you believe him? I mean, if it was A.D. 70, maybe God spoke to this man and, and he's telling you what God said and you could believe that. But now that it's past the writing of the book of Revelation and now that we know that no more words are to be added to it, I don't believe a word of it. I don't believe it. And I, early on, 20 some odd years ago, I was kind of listening to some of these guys. Oh, I got a prophecy. I got a, had a dream, had a vision about this. And, and I would say, God, is this man telling the truth? Is what he's saying right? And God just kept putting me back in the Bible and say, Mike, here's all the dreams and visions you'll ever need right here. Everything that I'm going to do in this world, I've already written it down in the Bible. So why do you need anything else? And God was right. Okay, if we can't trust what's in this book, who can we trust? So, let me read this again now. Whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So now we see it as the fulfillment of the writing of the New Testament. And it's perfect. Amen? So now look at what Paul said. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. By the way, Israel was always called the children of Israel. And you can take this and apply it to Paul's life. When Paul was a little boy, he spoke as a little boy. When he grew up, he became a man. He didn't speak that way anymore. When Paul was a zealous tribe of Benjamin Jew, he spoke as a child and understood as a child, only knowing the Old Testament. You understand that? But he says, now I become a man. Now I have the new Testament. And he says, now I don't speak as a child anymore. You don't hear Paul telling you, you need to follow the law. You need to be circumcised. You need to keep the feast. You don't hear Paul doing that. Paul doesn't speak that way anymore. Now he's grown up because he has the inner man in him, the new man. He has Christ in him and he's grown up. He's matured. So now he speaks as a mature man. For now, verse 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. So now here's another application of this. Even right now, even though we have every word of God sitting right here in front of us, we don't know it all. We don't understand it all. We say we believe it all, and we do, but we don't comprehend all of it. Some of it, especially, and you see this in the Bible, when Bible prophecies haven't happened yet, nobody really understands them. But after they happen, everybody goes, oh, that's what he meant. There are things in this Bible that have not occurred yet, and we're all just trying to guess at how they're going to happen. That's why I quit stomping my feet and get mad at everybody. Don't agree with me on Bible prophecy because I don't know what it is either. And anybody who says they've got it all figured out, I don't trust them anymore. I don't believe them. Okay. So, but one of these days, we're going to put off all this childish stuff and we're going to know it all. Amen. We're going to know it all. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Well, Brother George, we'll know who killed JFK. And Bobby and Marilyn Monroe, because I think it's all wrapped together. Okay? We'll know who Bigfoot is. We'll know about the flying saucers. All right? We'll know about Area 51. We'll know all the secrets of the Illuminati. We'll know everything. And we're going to come down judging the world because we're going to be perfected in that. 
Uh, let me give you examples. Turn to Job very quickly. I, uh, th I call this the new heaven and new earth principle. And I was just going through scriptures one day and th this just started. I was studying the word ladder. L-A-T-T-E-R. Ladder. Not like you climb a ladder, but ladder. The l things that happen, the former and the latter things. Notice there's a, there's a principle woven all throughout the Bible. In Job chapter 8. It was said of Job, though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end shall gr should greatly increase. Now think about that. What happened to Job? Job was already rich in Job chapter 1. But by Job 42, even though Job had had everything taken away from him, Look at what it says. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she asses. If you compare that with what Job had in Job chapter 1, it's double. God doubled what Job had. If Job was rich at the beginning of Job 1, Job was double rich by the end of Job. It's because God did it. When God does it the first time, it's awesome. When God does it the second time, it is beyond awesome. There are no words to describe it. If you've had a first birth and a second birth, you know what that's like. Your first birth was great. Your second birth was better. Amen? Your first body, eh. Your second body. It's going to be literally out of this world. That's how God does things. Amen? Look at Ruth chapter 3. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. God imparted this into Ruth. More, more blessing and more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. I don't have this in my notes, but turn to... Um, Turn to, what is it, John 6, I believe, where Jesus turned the water to wine? No! Turn that bell off. Let me show you this. Was it John 6? No, where was it when Jesus turned water? Huh? John chapter 2. Let me show you this. Jesus is God. So what Jesus does the second time is going to be better than what it was at the first. I'm not going to read all of this, but the story is there was a marriage feast and they served wine and the wine ran out. So they came to Jesus. Mary came to Jesus and to Jesus are out of wine. So Jesus says, verse 7, Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Do you see it? The best wine was given later, not at first. If you were to choose between the old and the new covenant, which is better? The new, but which came first? The old. God gave that first thing first, and it was glorious. So glorious that Moses' face shone like the sun. But it wasn't near as glorious as the new covenant. When Jesus comes down, his face is going to be shining brighter than the sun. Paul said that New Testament, that Old Testament was so glorious, but the law of liberty is more glorious than the first one. And what I'm telling you is everything that God does, if God does it, it's always better at the end than it is at the beginning. Isn't that neat? Now, think about this in the Bible issue. Most scholars, George, say that God inspired and... And the Bible was inerrant only in the original manuscripts. And then afterward, they faded into corruption. But that's not God's way, is it? 
God's way is what he does first is good, but what he does second is always better than what he did at first. I think the Bible's more right now than, and relevant than it ever has been in history because God is going to do in the days of this book everything he said. Amen? Well, I like this stuff. It makes me happy. Now I'm going to preach on hypocrites, all right? So we're going to have to pray. Heavenly Father, bless your word. Bless it in these people. Father, we know that what the devil gives us is good at first and terrible at the last. It's always that way. And everybody in this room knows it. Everybody knows it. We've all got drunk. We've all got high. We've all got this and all got that. And it was all good while the party was on. The young prodigal son realized that when all the money ran out, there was nothing left. And Father, we thank you, God, that you did not give us our best life now. We thank you, God, that the best life is still ahead of us and not behind us. Bless your word for these people, Lord. Bless them, I pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.